This is the Hollywood Outsider, a weekly entertainment podcast. For this week, we are reviewing Savages and Ted. We're going to look at the upcoming release, The Dark Knight Rises, little independent movie. Um, the From the Outside In topic this week is we're going to look at what is wrong with film ratings and what we think they should do to fix it, because we know everything. Uh, the latest in movie and TV news, our own trivia and flashback DVD segments. We are going to have a little <clears throat> contest this week, so if you would like to win an I'm a Ho shirt, continue to listen. You're going to hear how. And you can always subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or anywhere else you can find an RSS feed. With that, my name is Aaron Peterson. I am your host. With me today are my fellow hosts, Justin McCumber. Apparently, I'm a ho. You are a ho. Brian Williams. I'm a ho. <laughs> you, you sound like a ho. And Scott Clark. Mr. Lindsay, if you're nasty. You. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how's everybody doing? Doing good, man. It's, How about you? It feels like we've had a shorter week this time. Well, we kind of did, you know. Yeah, we had an early one. Yeah. Apparently that messed up. I actually got several emails about, did you guys stop doing the show? It was oh, really? one day. One day. Yeah, I got like two emails. Did you guys stop doing it or what? Like, no, it's just a day late. It's okay. I feel it's, like called easy. it's called a holiday. I, know, I was going to say, 4th of July, man. <laughs> Give us a break. Uh, so for the people that uh, we confused, we're sorry. Episode 49 is still available. Go check it out. It's got Amazing Spider-Man in it. <laughs> Uh, let's just jump in right in with movie news. Michael Fassbender will start, and this is going to sound like the uh, the Scott Clark podcast after a while. You'll, <laughs> you'll see why. But the Michael Fassbender is going to star in and co-produce Assassin's Creed. It's a huge game franchise from Ubisoft, and it's going to be hitting the big screen. This is uh, this is pretty exciting for me, obviously, because I'm a big video game nerd. But as we all kind of know, video game movies just don't work very well. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've. I mean, since Super Mario Brothers and and the Resident Evil series, you shut your whore mouth. That was an amazing film. <laughs> you just okay, <laughs> really? Any credibility you might have had just <laughs> out the window there, Mister. Uh, and and I was excited when like Resident Evil was coming to, to coming to big screen, and and I was disappointed. Although I know Justin does like those for more of a guilty pleasure kind of thing, but. The fact that Michael Fassbender is attached to this so early on really gets me excited. For those of you that aren't familiar with the Assassin's Creed uh, series, it's a video game series that's based on a character named Desmond who's kidnapped by some kind of government organization or what appears to be a government organization, and he's forced to uh, use a machine that that goes into his brain and allows him to relive uh, memories from his ancestors. Um, and then he finds out that his ancestors were assassins, and uh, one takes place in... Um, I, I, during the Crusades, yeah, yep. and the other mm-hmm. takes place during uh, um, ah, it's the Renaissance. The Renaissance, thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, the third one, which is coming up here this this Christmas, is, is going to be taking place during the American Revolution. So there's a lot of historical kind of things going on in the movies, mixed with in science. The games, you mean? Or in the games, excuse me, um, mixed with science fiction, which which uh, appeals to me a whole lot, and I like the games very much. But like I said, my consternation about Video game movies is still there, but the fact that Michael Fassbender is acting in it and co-producing in it gets me a little. Put, see, I feel like I got a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel with this. Yeah, and, and I'm Did excited. You see Shame because if you saw Shame, you'd be really excited. Is that is that the one where he's naked? Yeah, I was. didn't see yeah. it. <laughs> I think it sounds great. I, do. I I love Assassin's Creed. Oh yeah, and he, it sounds I mean, like he, a great idea. I just don't know. Are they going to go with the Crusader period? Memories? Are they going to go with the Renaissance? How are they going to break it up? Because there's a lot of historical material there, and who they get to play those historical ancestors of his is really going to, you know, matter quite a bit. Fassbender's great, but you don't see a lot of Desmond in the games. He's probably what maybe ten percent, mm-hmm. if that, of the game. So in the movie, they're going to have to balance that out a bit more i'd be curious to know who's going to be playing his ancestors well in the in the games altair who was the the assassin from the first assassin's creed game was the same character model of desmond in the in the game must not get too game crazy here no i'm just saying it's, it, they were the same person they were supposed to be ancestors uh, I understand that. you know what I'll, I'll be honest with you that, there's a whole present day element that people don't maybe that never played it because mm-hmm. most people probably haven't played it they're probably not gamers right um Assassin's Creed has a present day element where basically a guy is in a machine and it filters back to, like Scotty said, historical events. That's the whole portion of the story I hope they drop. I didn't like it in the game. I don't want to see it in a movie. I, I just I just think they should have the assassin portion from whatever time frame they look for, whether it be the Crusades or the Renaissance or American Revolution. I don't care what the time frame is, but just stick with the assassin story. That's what I would want to see. But isn't, I mean, but, I mean, and I. You know, this might be a newsflash to you guys, but I, I haven't played any of them. 
Mm-hmm. That's but good. I, you know, but but I do know a little bit about you know just as a gamer, I do mm-hmm. know a little bit about them. But if you just have the assa- whatever time period he's doing the assassinations in, I mean, don't you just basically you don't have a video game movie? You've just got a period piece. That's fine. Well, then. yeah, I mean, there's a, there's the the sci-fi element that kind of acts as bookends to the the games. And as well as this whole sci-fi premise, even into what the historical figures are doing. I don't really think that – I think if you get rid of the modern-day stuff, the actual sci-fi elements of the historical stuff might become even more jarring. I think you kind of need that to bridge through all of it. So I, I think they should do both. And Fazbender playing Altair, I could see him doing it, and I think he'd do a really good job. Okay. And to kind of echo what what you said, Justin, about how do you you know which period do they go in? I could see them going all three or yeah. two or four or three because in the game it's a good twelve fifteen hour game, but there's a lot of downtime in that that's not story related. Right. So you could just take you could go into all three in one in one movie and do three different acts, and I think it would work. I just hope they hire Kristen Bell <clears throat> to okay. reprise her role. Yeah, that would be super. That would be cool. Mm-hmm. Well, let's try to get the ladies back to the stage. Um, Channing Tatum. <laughs> Is going to star in and produce Evil Knievel, an Evil Knievel flick based on Stuart Barker's uh, book Life of Evil, and also P.S. Magic Mike Two is in the works. <laughs> That's a true story. So we're going to get another uh, rendition of your, your, another review from you. Yeah, I hope so. You guys will get another oh, sex review. Oh God! <laughs> oh. I'm more I'm more excited about the Evil Knievel. I am oh, I guess shit. barely old enough to remember him doing the stunts. Mm-hmm. So that was uh, I mean. You know, back in the day, that was that was very exciting TV. Now it's you know it's more like a thirty Reality second show. clip on Sports Center. But you know, thirty years ago, that was pretty awesome to see a guy ride a motorcycle over fifteen school buses or something like that. So I'm kind of I know the guy isn't as heroic as the I guess we kind of made him out to be, but I'd kind of like to see a little bit more about his life. Yeah, so, how he got into that, why he decided right. to jump fifteen school buses when he had a perfectly good road in front of him. Okay. <laughs> Broke four hundred and something bones. Yeah, didn't yeah, he there's, literally... pl- there's plenty of roads around the Grand Canyon. You don't need to jump it. <laughs> <laughs> didn't he like literally break every bone in his body or yes. something like that? Like, yeah, okay. theoretically, I don't know if literally, but uh, oh, okay. I, I don't know if he actually broke every single bone. He's broken more than two hundred six bones. That's basically what they're saying. Wow. Um, Fifty Shades of Grey, that cougar loving phenomenon about an S and M relationship with a billionaire and a younger woman is one step closer to the big screen. Universal has set Mike DeLuca and Dana Brunetti to produce the flick. And next, all I got to do figure, now is figure out uh, who's going to write it, direct it, and star in it. And this is one to watch because people will not stop talking about it. Yeah, and it's really unfortunate. I have I haven't purchased it myself, but I've read some excerpts from it. And you know, I, I kind of have to agree with a lot of the people who've poo-pooed on it. It's not... From my readings of it, it's not a very well written book, and so I'm really not entirely sure what it is about these novels that has so captured the attention of the world. I mean, erotica is nothing new, it's been written and published for decades, centuries. Why suddenly this book? I guess maybe. It's just erotica enough to be sexy, but just not enough to pass as a you know your standard literary book. It's maybe it walks a tightrope better than most, but I don't get it. I don't care for it. But obviously, millions of people have bought it. It is a hugely successful series of novels, and you cannot have that kind of success without Hollywood sniffing around and and wanting to make a film of it. Um, I, I read the article on this, though, and there was one sentence, though, that just kind of stuck in my craw, and it was said by the author of the, the novel, E.L. James, when she was talking about Michael DeLuca, who's going to come on and produce the movie. Uh, she says, I'm thrilled that Mike has joined Team 50. If you're fucking calling the people working on the, the movie of your book, Team 50, then you need to go fuck off. <laughs> That is, that is that is obnoxious. <clears throat> I don't know what the phenomenon is for. Uh, I, I've talked extensively to some friends of mine. My, my friend Heather is just devout into this book, like won't stop talking about it. Kind of creeps me out, to be honest with you. 
Um, and I've got a lot of guy friends, and they're creepier than any of them. I'm, I'm just <laughs> even you, Scott. I mean, thank you. The the level that some of them are going to to ex- explain their excitement over this book is shocking to me. I don't quite get it. They keep telling me There's you gotta read it. You gotta read it. You gotta there. read it. I mean, I've written erotica that I think is better than this. Well, of course you do. <laughs> yes, that's true. Anything I write would be better. <laughs> but I, I'm kind of confused too. What makes this better than just the typical romance novels you see on the show? This shelves? isn't a romance novel. It's, I mean. it, no, this is porn. S and M. S and M. <laughs> it's erotica. I mean, there's a level of sex and detail given to it that goes way beyond your typical bodice ripper type of romance novel. Well, yeah, but I, I don't know what I'm going to – how interested I'm going to be in seeing a full-length feature movie about s and I mean, I don't think it's being written for you, sir. No. I, no. <laughs> this, it's, it's Magic Might, but way more graphic. Yes. There you go. If they cast Chaney and Tatum in this movie, it's like $300 million. I promise. <laughs> now, if they do get someone like uh, Angelina Jolie to star in it, oh, God. Know, then maybe she's, my interest might she's increase. She's too old. Bit, no, she's man. too old. It's supposed to be like a young girl. It's a younger she's like woman. 50. She's like fifty. Who would you like Is to it? see in this role? In the I don't know anything it. about the story, so I really couldn't couldn't justify. Mm. I couldn't tell you. Jennifer Lawrence, because I think she should be in anything. Oh shit! Ticket bought. I see. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Will Young Lee, Brian Lee, Huro Yuki, Sonata. Bam! My brother would be proud. Have all signed on as uh, Yakuza baddies in Hugh Jackman's The Wolverine. That's the sequel to X-Men Origins Wolverine. And we all know a lot more about the sequel, and it's going to begin filming next month, finally. Yes, yeah, Sonata is is a fairly popular Japanese actor. I know he's won a couple of awards recently, but I, we've mostly seen him as kind of a supporting character in films like Sunshine and The Last Samurai. Uh, so I've kind of... He's one of those guys I recognize, and I I like the characters he plays. So I'm kind of kind of excited about this. I know he's kind of got a kind of a tough demeanor, and the little bit that I kind of remember about him, uh, I just don't think he'll do fine as the uh, yakuza boss. <laughs> and uh, I, I guess he's the father. Yeah, he's a, who's also the father of the love interest for Wolverine. So yeah, that's pretty, pretty cool. Casting. It's going to be all in Japan. So that's or mostly in Japan. So that's pretty cool. Wasn't he also in Lost? I have no idea. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he did. He played the uh, guy in the temple. You just felt like it has to be we, required every episode. Got to have a lost reference in every yeah, goddamn seriously? episode, don't God. we? I just want to make sure I had the right guy. Let's let's just yes. move, move on before I have to punch Scott. <laughs> All right, now we might as well call it Scott's news section because <laughs> there's two more items in this portion, and I'm just gonna lump them together because otherwise Scott might explode. Deus Ex is being made into the. <laughs> For the big screen by CBS Films, it's about a security specialist whose body has been made over by nanotechnology. And also, Pacific Rim and Saw writers Patrick Melton and Marcus Dunstan have been tapped to write a God of War flick. Scott, please tell us what you think. (laughs) Thanks, man. Yeah. Well, the Deus Ex series is actually a series I didn't delve into too much. It originally came out in 2000, and I missed those. They were PC-only games. But there was a recent uh, game uh, released on consoles. It was uh, uh, Deus Ex. Uh, Revolution. Thank you, Revolution. And I played the game. I did not finish it. Um, it's it's one that the story intrigued me, but I didn't. I couldn't get into the gameplay enough to to finish it. But that said, it makes me happy that they're turning this into a film because I'd like to see where that story goes and how and how they do that. The God of War one seems. I I can't see that one working. And God of War is a God very of War is just violent. A basically. Yeah, just I'm sorry. Go ahead and explain. No, it's I mean, God of War is uh, it follows uh, Kratos, who is basically tasked with or decides he's going to get revenge on all of the all of the gods, and it's an incredibly violent, brutal. I'm talking heads being ripped off, blood just pouring out of everywhere, and even though it's made by the people that made Saw, who obviously did a good job of of making violent movies, mm-hmm. after Saw two and three, I mean, that whole series became a joke more or less, and and. A, a serious movie, I think, and I, I just can't see God of War be, being making a good film. If it was like a CGI film, yeah. I think I'd be really into it. But the idea of a live action God of War, that, that move, that game is just so over the top. Mm-hmm. I don't know how you could do it in live action and and maintain that kind of over the top nature. As soon as you dumb it down a little bit, I think you lose all of the flavor that makes God of War such a viscerally fun game. Well, plus the fact that you're not controlling the character. That was a lot of the appeal of God of War was was it felt like every hit was being done by you. All the combos and right. 
swinging those chains and the mm-hmm. swords at the ends of them. And and just sitting and watching that is not nearly as exciting as holding the controller in your it's hand. It's Wrath of the Titans. Well, did, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to ask. Was didn't we just have that called Wrath of the Titans? But mm-hmm. yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Oh, uh, but Kratos kicks the shit out of Perseus. Well, <clears throat> we'll see when the movie comes out. Ooh. I'm far more yeah. Let's have a challenge. Let's have a throw down. <laughs> I'm far more interested in the Deus Ex. Uh, that's an interesting story. Mm-hmm. I didn't really care for the game at all, but the story is really interesting. So I'd be interested to see that. Yeah, but CBS Films hasn't done so well so far, so we'll see how they work that out. Yeah, I think of the three, the one we first talked about, the Assassin's, uh, Creed. Assassin's Creed is going to most interest to all of us. I mean, just the actor alone, and it's a more popular fr- franchise. Yeah, well, Hunger Games, we've talked about it many times, but this is you saw this coming, you had to see this coming. Yeah, um, Hunger Games third book, Mockingjay, is going to be split into two films. Duh, because we want to make more money. There's so much story to be told. Uh, part one will release November twenty first, two thousand fourteen, while part two is going to release November twentieth, two thousand fifteen. And Philip Seymour Hoffman has officially been cast as Plutarch Heavensby. Plutarch. Plutarch. Oh, Plutarch. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't read this shit. Plutarch Heavensby. <laughs> Milk that teat, huh? Yeah. I mean, they just. They. I mean, it's obviously a money decision, and it's not. I'm sure it's not got announced to do with artistic integrity or any other bullshit like that. Mm-hmm. You know, the last Harry Potter book was pretty large. So there was a lot to get to and a lot to wrap up. That made sense. Twilight's last book was a little bit larger than the others. You know, okay. You, I can, I can see that more, but just from looking and I haven't read any of them. I've just looked at the books on the shelf. Mm hmm. This one isn't really any different than the others. So I don't know. To me, it just says we're just trying to milk this out for five years. They yeah. want to do it every, have it released every November or around Thanksgiving every year for the, a total of five years, starting from last year. So That's what it seems like to me. I mean, I haven't read them myself, but that's what it seems like to me. Well, I've read all three of them, and, and Justin, I don't know if you'll agree with me or disagree with me, but... The length, they're about the same length, and they're, although the third book does take a different spin on the story, I don't see it being a problem wrapping up that story in one movie. I could be I could be wrong. A lot happens, but not enough to warrant a whole other movie. What do you think, Justin? I agree. I mean, the third one is it's, it's just such a dark, mm-hmm. violent book. To, to split that into two movies, I really think, is just stretching out what really would... I think in stretching it, you may actually lose some of the impact of it. Mm-hmm. I, they should, probably should have just kept it at one. Yeah. I agree, but I haven't read them, but I'm agreeing anyway. <laughs> Eli Roth is in talks to direct Russell Crowe as Dracula, which that sounds really cool. Uh, in Warner Brothers Harker, it's, got, it's about a Scotland Yard detective pursuing the vampire Dracula. Yeah, you know, we talked about this, something similar to this a, a couple weeks ago when they were talking about doing a, a movie based on the ocean voyage mm-hmm. of Dracula getting from Transylvania to London. And I, I guess Dracula's star is once again on the rise. But I like the idea of uh, Russell Crowe playing Dracula. I think, you know, the guy has got a lot of gravity. I, I would be really curious to see uh, his take on that kind of a character and Eli Roth, I'm not a huge fan of his acting. I mean, of his directing, you know, when he played the Jew bear, I, I liked him <laughs> quite a bit, but, uh, I, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm curious though. I'm, I'm worried that we are going to go into Dracula overload and, uh, it's just all going to start blending together. But there was in the article, they mentioned that they haven't cast Harker yet. And, you know, the film is called Harker, and so you would think that getting that character <laughs> cast would be one of their top priorities. But uh, one uh, a source says that uh, once they figure out the story, then they'll figure out who's right to play him. Well, how the fuck are they doing all the rest of this if they don't even have the story set yet? It's Hollywood. I guess, and maybe that's one of the problems with Hollywood is they're so interested in locking down contracts and all these other things that it, it's like they're building a house, but they're trying to get all the paint, you know, bought first, and they haven't even put the walls up yet. But one thing, one thing I saw that I thought was really interesting is they are looking to, and of course they want to make everything a series. I get that, but they're looking at making the Scotland Yard detective 
pursuing the vampire and pursuing other supernatural things, a series of some sort, which sounds kind of cool in a like a Night Stalker sort of way. So that mm-hmm. part actually caught my interest. If they did that, I wish they would pick a different character than Dracula because that's been done to death, mm-hmm. yeah. um, literally. But oh. yeah, I didn't mean to, but it happened. <laughs> um, but it, it's an interesting take on it, and I really love the Night Stalker take on things, and I wish they would just make something like that. That would be pretty interesting to me. Um, yeah. But, you know, we'll just see how it goes. But Harker is one of those characters that they could definitely so do you think make the, more movies on. Mm-hmm. Do you think the the Harker may compete with the Van Helsing reboot as far as the the creature hunter type? Uh, yeah, I would, I'm more interested in Harker because it hasn't been done yet. You know what I mean? So it's something new. Where Van Helsing has been done, and I still would prefer Hugh Jackman back in it than Tom Cruise. Hell yeah. Yeah, but that won't happen, so. <laughs> Let's move on. Comic-Con is this week, so or will be going on throughout the week. So we'll have a lot of interesting news next week, I would assume, for you. Uh, hey, yeah, now our condolences out to the uh, the family of the lady who was killed. Oh, yesterday. yeah, did you, that was a horrible story. Hear about it. What horrible. Happened? She's standing in line for a Twilight event. And the car came by. I don't know the condi- the reason why a car was driving fast enough in an area where people are standing in line. But anyway, she got struck by a car and died at the hospital. She never gained consciousness and died at the hospital. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. That's a terrible. So, a sad story. Way to wait for Brian to bring the joy. You know what I mean? Hey, well, we can pick it up. <laughs> okay. Well, now it's time to pay a little visit to... Welcome to Brian's Trailer Park. All right. Uh... Most of the time, when a police officer tells you what to do, you pretty much do it. One day at the Chick Witch, which is a chicken fast food place, the manager gets a call from the police alleging that one of her employees has stolen from a customer. So the policeman asks Sandra, who's the manager, to follow step-by-step instructions to interrogate uh, the employee, even though it gets progressively more and more invasive. So... This feels creepy as hell, but not exactly like in a horror creepy, you know, but it's more like that Aaron is staring at me from the seat behind me <laughs> in the, in the, that you get in a movie. So in pedophile drift. <laughs> I really, I kind of want to see this. I think this is kind of a fresh looking movie. You haven't said the name of the movie yet. It's com- okay. It's compliance. <laughs> yeah. There you go. There we go. Justin's um, still okay. laughing. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I think it looks really interesting. This is an interesting concept. The fact that they're taking the how HR operates currently in, in corporate environments and whatnot and how people are so afraid of having any problems. So it sounds to me, then I mean from the trailer, doesn't it almost seem like they got somebody randomly calls and then says they're with the company? It's obviously somebody trying to get revenge or yeah. cause problems with this girl. Right. It's yeah, that's what it looks like, you know, some kind of stalker or, or revenge thing for not going out with him or something like that. But, uh, you know, but it's just it's really kind of fascinating from the aspect of you get a phone call saying, hey, this is the police. And it's not like a guy that shows up in uniform. It's just a guy over the phone. Mm-hmm. I mean, you don't really know that. I mean, I think after I might do the first, you know, one or two things he asked. But after that, I'm probably saying you need to bring your ass here. Yeah, but, you you're know, also, but, but this is a 19-year-old girl that doesn't know anything about the law and what's allowed and what's not. She's just right. kind well, of... Like, and, and a, a man, yeah, and this lady, this manager is, is is really just kind of taking this guy for oh, his yeah. word. And so, Brian, you'll do the first couple of, of cavity checks, but after that, <laughs> hey, bro, I need a badge. <laughs> that or, you know, some kind of pill to help me, you know, finish out the rest. <laughs> I don't know, the only thing I hated about this trailer, and I hate it when other trailers do it, is when they constantly throw up quotes from other movie makers, uh, magazines, podcasters. awards, yeah, podcasters, just constantly <laughs> telling me how fucking good this movie is. To me, that just screams of, I am trying really hard to make you want to see this. And so it actually ends up turning me off that I'm just seeing quote after quote after quote in between these shots. It's like, all right, come on. Don't sell so hard. Right, let me decide I for am- myself, right? Do what? Let me decide for myself. Yeah, yeah. What else we got, B? All right. Uh, well, just as a just so you know, compliance opens August 17th. Sweet. So. Uh, next up 
we've got Silver Linings Playbook. You know, everybody's got their problems. We all do. But Bradley Cooper and Jennifer Lawrence are both crazy as a shithouse rat. <laughs> Bradley Cooper plays a former teacher who spends some time in a mental institution. And when he gets out, he moves in with his parents, tries to work things out with his ex-wife. But then he meets Tiffany, who's played by Jennifer Lawrence, wow. who's just as nutty as he is. I personally love uncomfortable humor, which is what this movie, I don't know if it has a lot of it, but it looks like it has enough of it to kind of draw me in. Some of the dinner scenes in this and direct questions are funny, but not in your typical rom-com type of fashion. So mm -hmm. does this do anything for you guys or? Hey, it's got two beautiful actors in it. What's not to like? I mean, Bradley Cooper and Jennifer, Jennifer Lawrence. Lawrence and Jennifer Lawrence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. I, I don't know, and I can buy Bradley Cooper being a being a drug addict. I don't know if I can buy Jennifer Lawrence. She looks too clean cut, and I thought she did a great job in the trailer. Well, she, no, no, I'm saying she. I'm saying she played a great crazy. The horror. little jogging <laughs> scene where she she looks fucking nuts. <laughs> <laughs> she looked I, fucking hot. Is what she said. No, I was too busy looking at those jogging pants. Oh, anyway, you, too. you guys are so simple minded. The the movie looks really. Oh, good. thanks, Aaron. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're such a complex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's it. Me and Aaron up here. You guys. <laughs> that's right. You got her. That's right. What about what about Chris Tucker in the trailer? Uh, dude, I didn't know he was still acting. Where did I, I, I come from? I saw him and I'm like, is that Chris Tucker? <laughs> I I went to IMDb just to check and see, has he been acting this whole time and I've just missed everything he's done? Nope. He's this is the first Medea movies. <laughs> <laughs> that's the first thing he's done since Rush Hour Three. Really? Yeah. I'm like I don't know. I've got to find out what brought him back to do this movie, but I love the concept. I, obviously, I love psychology. I love the whole yeah. background of psychology. So anything where you got a crazy nut guy, I, I'm in. And Bradley Cooper is one of my favorite actors. So yeah, and seeing Chris Tucker title, and seeing Chris Tucker do yeah. a character that's not over the top. Yes, actually, very kind of refreshing. I, I agree, Justin. The um, the title is awful. Yeah, it's a terrible title. It will never make money because of that. If it did, I'd be shocked. It's going to be one of those art house movies where it makes $15 million and goes away. Why can't they, like, just even just well, calling it Silver Lining would be. That's true. Better. I think it's a book. Well, what it is. Yeah, and I, you know, yeah, but I don't, I don't know if he, he looks like he might. I don't, I don't know anything about it for other than what we saw, but just kind of maybe overanalyzing some of the scenes. You know, he's, he's a former teacher and he's got like the track suits and stuff on. Maybe he's like a, you know, football coach or something like that, basketball coach or I don't know. You know, so maybe that's where the word playbook comes into play. But uh, it does open November 21st, which I'm sure is close to where the Hunger Games movie pops up. So you are you guys may be right. This movie may not do anything. And it may be one of those that we find later on on Blu-ray. They says, oh, hey, this thing, this thing's pretty good. How would I miss it? So, Should have Taylor Kitsch in it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but again, like I said, it opens November 21st, and the name of that is Silver Linings Playbook. Uh, if any of these movies sounds appealing to you, go to thehollywoodoutsider.com. Tweet us at H underscore Outsider. You can go to our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash thehollywoodoutsider, or send us an email at feedback at thehollywoodoutsider.com, which apparently... We seem to be getting more and more of here lately, so we appreciate that. Sincerely. Look at that, Love Brian. <clears throat> Brian, selling, selling, selling. ABCs. <laughs> and we have T-shirts. Just saying. <laughs> They're fucking awesome. <laughs> All right. Now it's time for Stump the Ho. Stump the Ho. Each week, one of our hosts poses a trivia question to the remaining hosts in an attempt to stump their fellow hoes. Ho stands for Hollywood Outsider, not actual prostitutes. This time, it is Justin's term. Justin, try to stump us hoes. All right. Well, later on in the show, you guys are going to be reviewing Ted. And so I thought this week I would make my question Seth MacFarlane specific. Um, in 2009, Family Guy was nominated for a Best Comedy Series Emmy, making it only the second animated series ever to be nominated in that category. What was the first show? Was it A, Bugs Bunny, B, Popeye, C, The Flintstones, D, The Simpsons? Ooh. Scotty? Deep come, sigh. Deep come sigh. back to me. No, you don't come back to Why me. Why do you always start with question? me? Because you're the one that happens. You're all smiley and shit. <laughs> I'm all smiley. Yeah. All right. Uh, what was A again? Bugs Bunny. I'm going to go with The Simpsons. Okay. 
Brian answered because you copped out. It seems like the easy answer, but I'm gonna go Bitch. with I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna go with the Flintstones. I'm okay. actually gonna say the Flintstones as well. I think the Simpsons is too easy. Very good. Your, okay. your mom is too easy. <laughs> really? We're gonna go that. We're gonna go that route. <laughs> we will uh, learn the answer to the question a little later in the show, so stick around. And now the details on our contest for next week. Or actually, it's for this week, but you'll find out who wins next week. Um, send us a stump the hoe question. Anything you want. I will randomly draw one of these questions just prior to showtime. The other hoes, Scott, Brian, and Justin, will not know anything about it or what it is. If that random question manages to uh, stump at least two of our remaining three hoes, so basically two out of three, well, I guess I just said that, um, <laughs> <laughs> you will win an I'm a Ho Hollywood Outsider t-shirt. It basically says, I'm a Ho on the front, and on the back it says, are you a Ho with our website address. It's actually a really cool shirt. Uh, I'll get pictures on the site here soon, so you can you can take a look. Sizes and quantities are limited, and it has to be reason reasonable. None of that. What does a sign at the one fifteen mark of Matrix say? It has to be a reasonable question. It has to be multiple choice. There has to be four choices, um, and we will draw out of however many choices we get. So send your questions to feedback at the Hollywood dot com if you want to win an Amaho T shirt. All right, sounds exciting. I'm excited. I can't breathe. That was I'm so much giddy. Crap. All right. I'm just I'm just all the Twitter over here. You're excited. Feel these nipples. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the big screen, Scott. <laughs> all right, do a quick recap of last week's episode. This was episode forty nine, The Amazing Spider Ho. Obviously reviewed uh, The Amazing Spider Man as well as Magic Mike. And we also talked about the releases for July thirteenth, which included The Imposter, Red Lights, and Ice Age Continental Drift. <laughs> Not to be confused with pedophile drift. Um, That's our the one to- I want to see. Our topic of the week was our, our most annoying film cliches. Okay. Now it's time to review new releases. Uh, Scott saw Ted and I saw Savages. So we'll start with the, the most recent one. Taylor, box office kitsch is Chan. And Aaron, I wasn't hit girl in kick-ass Johnson. That shocked me, by the way. I'll get to that later. He plays Ben. There are two guys that team up to grow weed in Laguna Beach, California, and which is branded as like the, the best high you can buy. So I don't know enough about weed, I guess. So if you guys want to chime in and tell me how cool weed is, here's the time. Right. Yeah, right. Exactly. It's bad for you. Just don't do it, kids. How it works is Chan, which is Taylor Kitsch, he's the muscle. He's the one that takes care of all the, the shady dealings and all that kind of stuff. And Ben is the, the grower who's kind of like a Buddhist, and he wants to help everybody, and he's doing this for the money so he can save African kids and whatever the hell else he's got going on. Oh. he got a nice little private enterprise going on. Yeah, isn't it sweet? He's the good drug dealer. He's the good drug dealer. Um, they also both share and date the same woman in O. <laughs> it's short for Ophelia. I'm sorry, that just makes me laugh. They, they, just, they literally share her. Like they take turns taking her on dates and showing her a literally a good time. Um, and that's played by uh, Blake. Sorry about Green Lantern Lively. <laughs> Their relationship sounds batshit crazy, and somehow the movie makes it work. I don't quite understand it, but I watched the movie. It seemed to work for me. Even though if, if they were truly friends that had this problem, you would think at one point one of them would say, okay, you stop. My turn. You no longer. You go get your own lady. But unfortunately, their high caught the attention of a Mexican Baja cartel, and the vicious head of the cartel is, play, is Elena, who's played by Salma Hayek, who is still my number one crush, if anybody cares. She decides she wants a piece of the action, so the guys, they just say, uh-uh, I don't want no piece of that. They try to get out of it. The cartel says, no, you're going to make this deal. So they kidnap O and say, we're going to hold her for a year, and you have to cooperate. If you cooperate, you can have her back in a year. If you don't, we're going to send her your, we're going to send you her body parts throughout the year. Get the gist of it? Mm-hmm. John Travolta pops up. He's a crooked DEA agent, working both sides. And Benicio Del Toro, that's right, with the accent, plays the cartel muscle and resident psycho who is helping with the kidnapping O situation. And then what happens is that the guys basically, they realize that they're not going to get O back if they don't take matters in their own hands. So they pretend to cooperate while they're trying to take this cartel out and play both sides and, and et cetera. That's when the violence ensues and both sides get more and more graphic and savage-like. This is based on a book. I'm not familiar with the book at all. Justin, are you familiar with the book at all? I ain't seen shit. <laughs> <laughs> that worked? Literally. No, I sure haven't. Well, overall, I can't compare it to the book. Overall, it's a pretty suspenseful movie. Oliver Stone directed it. It was really nice to see him come back and do a movie that doesn't have a bunch of deep political undertones. That was nice because that's what he's been stuck in for a long time. This is really just a straightforward, violent crime pick through and through. 
the actors are all pretty solid. Taylor Kitsch in particular proved it. he's he's a good actor. He really is. And he's got charisma and charm and the guy's got some balls behind him. It's not him, it's the movies or the marketing. Something is the reason that his movies haven't clicked. So I feel bad for him because probably he won't get hired again. So this might be the last time we actually see him in a theater. He's going to start showing up in like Val Kilmer picks or something. Well, it might have something to do with the fact that his balls are behind him. That's got to be wow. uncomfortable. Oh. <laughs> Touche. He'll be, in that, he'll be in the next Wolverine movie, won't he? It's Gambit. I have no idea. I have no idea. We'll find out. He's going to be free, I'll bet. So they can probably pick him up. It was really weird seeing the kick-ass kid all grown up. It was really weird seeing him in this movie. Because it took me a while before I realized who he was. Because I saw the name and I'm like, is that the kid from Kick-Ass? No, it can't be him. And you see him and he's he's all scruffy. He's grown up. I mean, he looks like he's 35 years old. And that movie was only like a couple of years ago. Yeah. So I, I, I really don't understand. I, maybe he had a hard time because he didn't get recognized as much as Brian recognizes Chloe Moretz. But he did a really good job. He played a nice Buddhist. Blake Lively was, was fine, but... I think some people are either touting her or condemning her for this performance. It seems there's no middle ground. I thought she was just okay. If you saw the town, you saw the same performance. Just a little. This is a little happier than than that one. Um, this is happier. I heard this was well, violent. Well, she's a she's a really evil chick in oh. the town. She turns into basically uh, she she really turns into a bad person. Mm-hmm. She's a really nice person in this movie. I mean, she tends to be a little open, but. She's a nice person. Well, she's doing two dudes at the same time. Selma Hayek was great. Fantastic as a, as a mother. Vicious cartel runner. I mean, she did a really wonderful job of walking that fine line between I'm a soft, caring mother, I care for my, my kids, and also I'm going to cut your fucking head off if you don't do what I say, you stupid white girl. I, I was actually really impressed with her. So she did a nice job. John Travolta was hysterical. So I don't know if he was trying to work off some I'm getting sued for all my massage and shit steam, but... He did a really good job. He was batshit crazy and did a great job. And Benicio Del Toro, he's a standout. The guy is creepy as hell. He's a he's a violent, sick bastard, and he'll do anything to handle his business. He he plays the character you expect to play in a movie like this, where you know he's there, he's there to do his job. He doesn't care about your what you have to say. He doesn't care about your personal uh, affiliations or anything else. He's there for business, and that's it. So he does a great job. So the action was skilled, scenes were tense, acting was solid, everything worked until the last 10 minutes of the movie. I'm not going to say what happens, I'm not going to imply what happens, it's not a twist or anything like that. It's just that it seems like the last 10 minutes of the movie, the filmmakers cross the line into the absolute preposterous, and that's really all I'm going to say about it. So if $10 is the full price of admission, the movie was a 7, the way it ended dropped it to a 5.5. Oh, wow. Yeah, was not a fan. Ooh. Yep. It's, I can't really say any more without ruining it for people, and I'm not going to do that. So Make me want to see it, though. All right, and you saw Ted. So I did. How see was Ted? Ted, Ted uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, I don't know how you can. It's advertised like crazy all over TV. It's it's a new Seth MacFarlane movie. Um, it's about John Bennett, played by Mark Wahlberg, who uh, actually starts out as a as a young child. Obviously, not Mark Wahlberg playing the character, but uh, the child has no friends, does, can't get along with anybody. Even even the kids that are getting bullied don't like him. And um, he has no friends, so he wishes for his teddy bear to to come to life and and be his best friend. And lo and behold, uh, the bear comes to life, and John grows up with with the uh, Ted as the as uh, John names the, the bear. Well, fast forward about uh, what about fifteen years later, fifteen twenty years later, um, Ted is foul mouth and vulgar and smokes pot and drinks beer and uh, has promiscuous sex with all sorts of women. And um, the teddy bear does. Yes, excellent. Which which is has a couple funny jokes with that too, but mm-hmm. I won't ruin them for you. But um, the story progresses a little further, and I won't spoil anything. But uh, it kind of takes a traditional um, comedy route. I, I went into this movie with average ex- expectations. Uh, I, I'm a fan of Family Guy. Um, and, and the humor and the, the pop culture references and, and the flashbacks and that kind of thing. And um, I, I got about pretty much what I expected from this movie. It kind of felt like a really long Family Guy episode. And I think that's actually to the film's detriment because I think mm-hmm. Family Guy's humor works in 20-minute segments. Mm-hmm. This film, and it sounds crazy, this film felt about 45 minutes too long. It's one of those that has a lot of great concepts and a lot of hilarious laugh-out-loud one-liners that could have been condensed down. It's one of those that I want to watch the, the 
the gago meter that they have in the DVD menus of movies. Mm-hmm. You know, we can see just the funny parts of it. Like I would rather watch it like that. The the sentimental portions and that kind of thing. Um, I just didn't do a whole lot for me. There's, there's more with the story about um, John as he's growing up meets Mila Kunis's character, and uh, they're in a relationship, and it's basically a, a, a triangle between the three of them. John trying to de- determine if he wants to be friends with Ted, this talking teddy bear, or uh, who uh, wouldn't want to be friends with a talking teddy bear? I know it's it's kind of yeah, but the other side is Mila Kunis, so and she looked gorgeous in this movie. Um, She's no Salma Hayek. I don't care what you say. But go ahead. <laughs> Like I said, I just I just wish it would have been condensed down. I, I, it would have worked better as a, as a short film as opposed to a, as as opposed to a feature length movie. There are some, like I said, some of the funniest laugh out loud moments I've seen in a, in a long time. Um, and, and granted, I might be a little jaded. I, I, I did the pathetic thing and I saw this movie by myself, <laughs> so I kept like wanting to turn to somebody next to me and laugh, and there was nobody there. <laughs> I'm not saying that to be depressing. I'm like it sure I, sure made us depressing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's. So, but like you said, you know how you say you don't like movies that have a lot of dick and fart jokes in them. I do not. No, there's a lot of dick and fart jokes in this movie. I mean, there's that's, uh, that's actually why I haven't seen it. Yeah, just because of that. Yeah. There are there are some Family Guy esque things that aren't dick and fart jokes that are really funny, just not not enough to warrant a full movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'd recommend a, a rental, probably, but it is doing well. I, I think I read somewhere on Facebook mm-hmm. they, were, they were talking about how. That weekend was the first weekend in history that all the women were going to see, or all the guys were seeing a movie about a teddy bear, and all the women were seeing a movie about strippers. <laughs> it's kind of ass backwards, That's funny. Yeah. but um, it's, it's, it's really funny, but just not not enough, and just just too much drama. I think if they would have cut it down and made it just comedy, it would have been good. Uh, if the full price of admission is ten dollars, I would have given it a six fifty. Mm. How much would you trim out of it? About forty five minutes. That's that's funny because my my buddy slash girlfriend Tyler. He said that he would trim 30 minutes out of it. So you said 45 minutes. You told me this beforehand, and he said 30. So I went and looked it up to see how long it was. Because I'm thinking, wow, is this thing like two and a half hours or something? Mm-hmm. It's an hour and 45 minutes long. Yeah. So basically, you <laughs> want it to be an hour, and he wants it to be an hour and 15. Mm-hmm. That does not sound like a, a great comedy to me. It but, would have been better as an HBO show there. Yes. <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, I mean, there's, there's too much trying to be sentimental and trying to be the happy – I learned my lesson, kind of thing oh, that, that yeah, a lot of those yeah. movies do. Yeah. I mean, I mean, not, not, not like Saturday morning special type stuff, but no, I get it. You know, I mean, the bear and him are, are are really good friends, and that and that's cool. But it's just it's just so extreme to the point. That, I don't know. Um, there is the really clever thing that they do with this movie is there's only one shock moment in the movie where someone is surprised to see a talking bear, and that's when mm-hmm. the, when when he's a child. When they fast forward to the year, everybody in the world is accepted that this bear has come to life and is talking. It's it's never once the rest of the movie like, oh, shit, a talking bear. Everybody, he's like a celebrity. Everybody knows him. And I think that was kind of cool because you mm-hmm. don't have to deal with all that BS of somebody, somebody no, seeing cool. it for the it, first No, it's a really time. cool idea, and it's really popular. So it it seems to be like it's catching out with people. Right. Oh, and the animation of Ted mm-hmm. is incredible. It, it, I didn't even realize that I was – I mean, you you have a hard time telling the difference between the stuffed bear and the the animated bear. Really? Until the very end, when they do some stuff with going back and forth, that mm-hmm. again story related. Um, to me, the the animated bear looks more realistic than the than the the stuffed bear. That's pretty funny. But, yeah. So yeah. I don't know. Well, that's Ted, and you give it a six and a half. Six and a half. All right. Now let's go to the speed run. That's for each week we have real quick reviews of anything that we've previously reviewed or is new to DVD. Um, Brian finally saw Amazing Spider-Man. A little late to the party, B. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, you guys saw it like opening day or something like that. So yeah, we saw it when it came out. Yeah, call me late. You know, so, yeah, I just saw it the weekend that it came out. It's not like you're in a movie <laughs> podcast or anything. Don't worry about it, man. No pressure. <laughs> all right, so speed round it. What'd you think? You don't have to do the plot and everything. If you want to hear that all over again, listen to episode forty-nine. What did you think of the movie? Overall, I liked it. I think Andrew Garfield's a much better Peter Parker than the kind of deer in the headlights looking Tommy McGuire. Uh, I like that they use some of the characters that most people don't associate with Spidey, uh, being like Gwen Stacy, Flash Thompson. I thought that was a plus. Um, the story was still fairly cliche. Scientist goes wrong, turns into a bad guy. Uh, I think all three of the last Spider-Man movies did the exact same thing. But um, there were a couple of moments where I thought, Maybe some dust got in my eyes, you know, kind of got me a little <laughs> choked up there, maybe. But uh, and the stinger in the end credits, uh, 
is mysterious, but looks to kind of set up a large expansion to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Hmm. But so it's worth worth checking out. So what do you give yeah, it out of ten? I'd give it a seven and a half out of ten. I wasn't blown away by it. It is very entertaining. It is good. There's some good humor, good action. Finally, about the last third of the movie or so. Mm-hmm. Um, but I will be much more excited for the second one now that the, now you know they've got the the groundwork laid as far as character, all that stuff. Now, let's see where they take it. That's what I want to see from here on. Um, and FYI, mm-hmm. the omission of "with great power comes great responsibility" yes. is a major crime. Yes, thank just you. Just saying, thank you. A crime against humanity, not even just filmmaking. It's it's just, <laughs> right. It's wrong. It's absolutely wrong and, and shameful. And it's just like leaving the force out. Uh, it's it's like you are the chosen one in the Matrix. I mean, it's just all that stuff. The One Ring will rule them all from Lord of the Rings. That's that's what it equates to. And exactly. It's just one of those things you just can't leave out. So cool. And I just rewatched all three of the original Spider-Man movies. By the way, Spider-Man you are three. Sad. What's that? What? Nothing. Oh. <laughs> I rewatched all three. The third one still sucks. I still love the first two. So I rewatched the first one as well as yeah. an experiment to compare the two. What'd you think? Real um, quick, real, real quick I, I still like the new one better. The, mm-hmm. the first one, although it has the more comic book feel to it, I felt like almost everybody in that movie was acting as opposed to being as believable. I don't say that in a bad sense because I love the movie. It just felt like, especially Tobey Maguire, just felt like everything he did was was he was trying very hard. To, to, for the performance. Well, I love Spider-Man too, and that that holds is one of my favorite superhero mm-hmm. movies of all time. So, Meh. yeah, well, you can yeah. all you want. It's my choice. Um, well, it's a wrong one. <laughs> it's a wrong one. <laughs> Scott, you've got a couple of quick one minute reviews. Uh, Wanderlust is the first one. Yeah, real quick. Wanderlust is uh, Paul Rudd and Jennifer Aniston who uh, basically get fed up with their suburban lifestyle and uh, take a crack at, at joining a commune. It's a, it's a more of a comedy than a romantic comedy. This is good for a one-time laugh. That's about it. I mean, they're they're both uh, recognizable uh, actors, and and they're both really entertaining and likable as always. Just not enough comedy uh, punches to give it a higher rating than I did of, of a five dollars out of ten. Okay. What about the other one, Mirror Mirror? Mirror Mirror is uh you know there, there's two Snow White movies that came out about around the same time, and this is a really odd telling of the Snow White story. It's very tongue in cheek. Um, with like a little bit of a modern twist on it, as far as the as far as the language and that kind of thing. Julia Roberts is about the only thing this movie's got going for it. Is it telling the whole Snow White story? Is that what it's doing? Basically, uh, I, yeah. It's just it's just a, it's a different spin on it, and and not a good spin. It's just it's just a very awkward awkward movie that uh, it, it just didn't work very well. The actor that they got to play Snow White, mm-hmm. I, I don't know why they couldn't have find a better looking girl to play this girl that's supposed to be absolutely gorgeous and everything. Is she an ugly girl? She's Is she not, homely or something? She's not ugly. She's got eyebrows that would make Eugene Levy go, damn girl, it's called the tweezers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit, that's a funny and, and And that is so distracting throughout the movie. I'm not even making it. I could not stop looking at her eyebrows. They're that big. Just go look at a screenshot from the film. It's terrible. Uh, like mustaches it, on her head. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it was not entertaining at all. Even my wife who was watching it with me was just like, did not enjoy it at all ten dollars is a price of admission i give it three bucks Ooh, ow all right then oh snap let's go to box office the amazing spider-man opened a little better than expected to 62 million dollars for a six day start of 137 million it won't match the heights of the previous series though it's it's setting this series up nicely for a sequel but the first three spider-man movies all made well over 300 million dollars the first one made over 400 million this one isn't going to come close but to be fair, it's it's a reboot. A lot of people thought it didn't need to be rebooted. It might have good legs. But Dark Knight Rises comes out in a couple weeks. Literally, like 10 days, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. Good good luck. You better hurry up and rack that cash up. Mm-hmm. It's not going to have the two-month run that name redacted got. <laughs> <laughs> sure not. Um, <laughs> Savages surprised everyone with $16 million. That's actually not bad. Uh, not a bad start for a lower-budgeted movie that most analysts thought it was a mistake to not release in the fall. Myself included. I think if this was in the fall, it probably would have played a lot better to crowds, the Savages movie. Um, so Taylor Kitsch, maybe. Maybe you'll get something out of the deal. I'm still convinced you're going to be working with Val Kilmer soon, so get ready. Katy Perry bombed with $7 million, far short of Justin Bieber's 29 to $30 million from last year. So the, the lesson is 
Justin Bieber is sexier than Katy Perry. I accidentally heard a Justin Bieber song. How did you accidentally hear it? Was it Boyfriend? <laughs> no, I, I, it he was... He tripped into a radio. And he tripped. accidentally put the CD in his... In his no, no, no. <laughs> it, it was like one of the go-between segments on, a, on another podcast I listened to because they were talking about Justin Bieber on that podcast. Uh-huh. And what in the hell is... That music is awful. It is... It is... Boyfriend's okay. That's okay. I haven't heard that one. You're defending Justin Bieber? No, I don't like Justin Bieber. You've got like all eight of his albums or whatever on iTunes, so... That's more albums than he is old, man. (laughs) (laughs) No, I I don't know anything about him. I've heard a couple songs. I've heard Boyfriend. That one's okay. He's just just bubblegum pop. He'll be gone in two years. He'll be a a heroin addict in five, so... (laughs) Uh, We can only hope. Well, now it's time to rock out with Justin McCumber. Well, there's really only one movie coming up that uh, is really worth talking about. July 20th, that's the weekend that the Dark Knight rises. Now, as we've done with past films that are such high profile, it's it's kind of hard to know what to talk about, what people already know. But uh, I did find some interesting facts, but we'll go ahead and give the, the basic setup of the film. Uh, having assumed responsibility for the crimes of District Attorney Harvey Dent, who became Two-Face, in order to protect his reputation, Batman is chased into exile by the Gotham City Police Department. Eight years after the events of The Dark Knight, the appearance of the mysterious Selina Kyle sets in motion a chain of events culminating in the arrival of Bane, a ruthless terrorist who plans to destroy Gotham City. With the future of the city at stake, Batman must emerge from his exile and confront Bane to bring about an end to his reign of terror. Now, this film cost $250 million to make, and it's got a running time of 165 minutes. For you mathematically challenged folks, that is two hours and 45 minutes. So make sure you go in there with a blanket. (laughs) Now, Christopher Nolan is the first director to actually complete a full trilogy of Batman films, but he's the second to direct a full trilogy of films on one superhero. Of course, Sam Raimi completing his Spider-Man films did it first. And Christian Bale is the first live-action hero to portray Batman Bruce Wayne in three Batman films. Fans of the animated films will, of course, know that Kevin Conroy's done the voice for those characters in uh, seven different movies. But live-action-wise, Christopher Nolan and Christian Bale are the first to do three of them. Uh, Interestingly, though, with this one, Nolan uh, elected not to film this in 3D, but instead stated that he intended to focus on improving the image quality and scale by using the IMAX format uh, in The Dark Knight Rises, he's got uh, about an hour of footage that was shot in IMAX. In comparison, The Dark Knight only contained about 28 minutes. Um, guys, it's the culmination of everything Christopher Nolan has been building up to. I think it's pretty safe to say that this is the biggest film in July, and I think that it's it's it could seriously challenge the avengers but i think that really depends on the early word are you guys excited for this do you think the avengers already kind of peaked comic book movies where are we at with this so uh aaron we can go ahead and start with you i i've i've heard some scuttle uh, you know from from friends that work in movie sites and whatnot i've attended some early screenings and i've heard the term masterpiece thrown around Twice, two different people have, have thrown that around without me saying a word about it. That makes me both excited and nervous because anytime you start building that kind of hype, it's like, oh man. But one of them I, I trust pretty well. So if he say masterpiece, I, I I have faith that the movie is gonna gonna go somewhere. Um, I'm really curious to see how this is gonna end. It's one of the few movies I've avoided every spoiler I could about. Um, I know that there's several reviews floating around online. I don't want to read them. Because I'm afraid that some idiot is going to spoil something drastic for me. And this is one of those I want to go to the Midnight Show um, <clears throat> with all the other crazy bastards that dress up like Batman. <laughs> um, probably friends of Scott. And <laughs> and and really be able to enjoy the movie and soak it in. Because honestly, this is just like, just like Dark Knight. I didn't know much going into it. And it was just a fantastic experience. Not just a movie, an experience. 
And, you know, we are going to have a spoiler cast to go through the whole Batman saga because this is a pretty big, big event and several people have asked us to do that. So we will. Um, but we still will review the, the film on the normal on the normal show. I can't wait. I absolutely can't wait. I already got my tickets purchased. Uh, I'm going to be there. going to be in line early. Might actually show up to the theater earlier than normal. I'm, I'm pumped. I can't really say much more than that. What about you guys? This film's been marketed almost perfectly to me personally, just because when the first trailer came out, if you remember from several episodes ago, we were all kind of, eh. Mm-hmm. There's not a lot of Batman in the trailer. There's not a whole lot of information about what's going on. We you couldn't uh, even understand. Yeah, yeah, you could. You know, Bane's voice. We couldn't understand what he was yep. saying. I'm sorry, Batman. <laughs> That's what it sounded like. And then the second and third trailers came out, and and this is every time I see the trailer because I see I've been seeing a lot of movies lately. <clears throat> every time I see it again and again, I get more and more excited about this. There's just enough information to get me interested without revealing too much of, of what's going on. I feel like there's so much mystery yet to be uh, uncovered to me. And like you said, it's going to be, it, it seems like it's going to be an amazing experience and a movie, and I, and I, I just can't be any more excited. I'm, I'm more excited to see this than I was to see The Avengers because, again, I, I, I didn't see all of the previous movies like you guys did, and I didn't mm-hmm. grow up with it. I, Chris Nolan's reboot of the series it was just fantastic to me, especially Dark Knight, and, and I cannot wait to see where he's taking it and what he's, what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Brian. Yeah. You, Brian? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty pumped for it. Also, I, I'm trying to avoid as, as much as I can, any, any input or any too much behind the scenes stuff, or even too much see, you know, seeing what the, uh, with the previews, although that like, I do agree with you with the, the trailers, how they've just about done it perfectly. The first couple that I saw, even up till fairly recently, I was just not impressed with it. It didn't, Take, it didn't detract from my want to see the movie, mm-hmm. but if I was on the, you know, on the board on the fence about it, it wouldn't have flipped me over to the right side. Right. Um, but within the last few days, they've they've released a, a one or two others, and and now they're they're like really good, but they're not giving away the story. You still don't know that you see some of the cool gadgets, you see some of the the action, but you still not not real sure of how all the characters relate to one another in the story sense. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I agree with you. I'm going to probably be there opening night. I'd rather, this is one of those movies to see with all the other comic book geeks and, and Batman fans and all that, because everybody's respectful. They laugh when they should. They, That's a good point. Mm-hmm. they clap when they should, <laughs> whatever. Um, but then after one or two seconds of that, it's done. And they, you know, everybody kind of says, okay, bam, what's next? Uh, so I'm, I'm pumped for it. I don't think it will do it. I personally don't think it'll do as big as Avengers either. No, it's a different kind of movie though. I, I mean, but I didn't think Dark Knight was right. going to make $500 million either. So yeah. Justin, what about you? Well, I think, you know, the Dark Knight, so much of its success rested on, um, you know, the Joker and the, the way that character was portrayed, um, I, I don't think this film has got that same draw. Uh, I think in, instead it has the draw of this being the final film. Um, and I think for a lot of people, knowing that this marks the the end of Nolan's vision of this character is, is going to be what draws them in. I'm not as big on this as, as you guys are. I've never been as big a DC man as I am a Marvel guy. Uh, I just grew up in the, in uh, the house that Stanley built, mm-hmm. uh, and because Nolan went in such a realistic direction with these films, I've never enjoyed them on the same level as I have enjoyed the the Iron Man movies or or Avenger, uh, uh, the Avengers. But I, I still really do want to see it. Nolan has yet to to fail me in practically any movie that he's made, and these Batman films have just been spectacularly well done, and especially that they bridge the gap that divide between the comic book and the real. He's, he's a master at it. So uh, I'll definitely be seeing it opening weekend. I don't know if I'll be doing the midnight showing, but uh, I will I will be there to see it uh, as quickly as I can, and, and I look forward to reviewing it with you guys, especially in the context of the other two, which I'll probably watch those before heading into the theater. 
Yeah, we're gonna have like a Batman movie night. Yeah, actually this weekend. So Blu-ray, yeah. Blu-ray, Blu-ray. First two on Blu-ray. Mm-hmm. Um, the one the one thing I wanna wanna add is that um, there is an IMAX event that if you would like to get into that, you still have time to do it. I think it's all three movies at the IMAX theater, right? For like twenty bucks or something, kind of what the Avengers did, but less movies. <laughs> so th- that's a pretty cool event. So if you can get into it, then you should knock yourselves out. But that's nine hours of of really dark sadness. So and trying to figure out. <laughs> Why is Katie Holmes here? Why is Katie Holmes not here? Where'd Katie Holmes go? You know, that sort of thing. So that's uh, that's an interesting thing. If you haven't done that, check it out. I think it's AMC Theaters is doing that. That's a pretty cool presentation. You know, now that you mentioned that, I don't think I've seen her or uh, Maggie Gyllenhaal in any of the trailers for the new one. Have you? Did you watch Dark Knight? Died Night? in Did... the second film. <laughs> Spoiler oh, yeah. alert. Oh, yeah. Duh. <laughs> Jesus, Scott. <laughs> you can edit that out. No, it's, past, it's far past the three-year mark. I think we're okay. <laughs> No, so, edit it out because I don't want to look like a dumbass. No, we're definitely leaving that out. <laughs> leave wow. it, leave it. Please. Man, and you, were, you were doing so good earlier. God, God you were in a roll, brother. <laughs> She's also divorced in Tom Cruise, if you didn't know that. That's all over the news, too. So pay attention. I and in recent news, the Titanic sank. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that is Dark Knight Rises, July 20th, right? Yep, July yeah. 20th. Okay, check that out. Uh, what's this movie? Well, now it's time for What's This Movie? Each week we have a movie clip that we play to see if you guys can guess what the movie clip is. It's kind of like a trivia for you. And last week was from a listener. It was Dustin B's Choice. And the answer was Little Big Man. And only one person, <laughs> only one person got it. And I will be honest with you, that was a hard one. Uh, and that was Mike B. And since he was the only one, I decided to read his email. Uh, thanks for the show. Love it. I'm a fairly new listener. I migrated over from the Dead Robot Society, which is actually McCumber's podcast. Woo woo! I've been <laughs> listening to the episodes behind schedule, and a couple weeks ago I heard the Easy Rider clip. I'm in my car saying I know this one, but it was too late. I knew I had to get caught up and listen, and within the week the episodes are uh, that the episodes are released. So for what it's worth, here's the answer. Little Big Man starring Dustin Hoffman. Awesome movie. Um, thanks a lot, Mike. You're the only person. We had, so we had several entries. You're the only person that got it right. So, congratulations. This week, it's another listener's choice, A.P. Stevens. So, if you think you know what this is, send us an email to feedback at thehollywoodoutsider.com. That's feedback at thehollywoodoutsider.com. Or tweet us at H underscore outsider. And let us know what you think the answer is. And we will give you a shout out in next week's episode. Here you go. Uh, Let's take a look. Okay. Let's start with the fingers. Good. Good. Now, raise the arm. Good. Good. Now, to the side. Good. Uh, now bend at the elbow. Good, good. And now rotate from the shoulder slowly. Oh! 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 oh, oh, oh. Funky butt loving. Did he say funky butt loving? Oh. All right, and that's your clip. If you think you know what that is, make sure you email us feedback at thehollywoodoutsider.com or tweet us at h underscore outsider. Thank you, AP Stevens, for that choice, and let's see if we can stump some other hoes. Um, let's go to the couch. What's coming up on DVD and Blu-ray, Scott? Not much on TV news this week. All right. This is going to be for the uh, release day of July 17th. The first one is Three Stooges. This is the Fairley Brothers uh, film adaptation, much to the chagrin of Justin. Uh, <laughs> um, also, uh, Lockout, which is Guy Pierce's uh, unofficial sequel to Kurt Russell's Escape from New York and L.A. That was a good movie, too. I, I'm definitely going to be picking that one, that one up. Uh, also, uh, Salmon Fishing in the Yemen, which IMDb calls An Upstream Journey of Faith and Fish. <laughs> this stars Ewan McGregor and Emily Blunt. Um, also, Friends with Kids, which tells the, it's a comedy about two platonic friends who decide to have a child together. This one kind of had a limited release, and uh, but Aaron actually saw a screening of it. One of my favorite movies of the year so far. And uh, it, it does have four actors from Bridesmaids, which we're all kind of fans of, but uh, this is not a direct sequel or anything like that, not exact directly correlated. Really looking forward to seeing that one as well. Also, Casa de Mi Padre. This is a Will Ferrell's subtitled comedy that I somehow missed the theatrical release of this. I didn't know it was coming to DVD already, which does not bode well for how good this movie It'll is. It'll probably be on Univision. Also, uh, Mel Gibson's Get the Gringo, where uh, he learns to survive in a tough prison with the help of a nine-year-old boy. I think Aaron might like this movie. Oh, fuck you. <laughs> What's Maggie Gyllenhaal doing? <laughs> and lastly, Intruders, which is uh, has Clive Owen... 
as a faceless being who visits two children. <laughs> Again, Aaron just ke- creeps up in these movies. A faceless being who visits two children living in different countries to possess them. Nobody's ever going to let me babysit again. You know no. that, right? Yeah, pretty much. Were you, were you doing a lot of babysitting already? <laughs> Go to flashback, fucker. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Hit me with that unknown shit. Flashback. All right, with that, we'll move on to our flashback DVD or Blu-ray of the week. This is where one of us hoes brings to the table a little-known or obscure movie that they'd like the rest of us to check out, as well as our listeners. Uh, this week, it's Brian's turn. So, Brian, sell us your movie, brother. All right, uh, Kevin Spacey is regarded as one of the better actors over the last 20 years, give or take. Uh, while he may get more recognition for American Beauty and Usual Suspects, one of my personal favorite acting performances is him playing Buddy Ackerman, in Swimming with Sharks. Ooh, uh, good choice. Buddy Ackerman is a cutthroat douchebag movie producer. Kind of think more of a sadistic Ari Gold from Entourage. And uh, just totally the boss from hell. Guy is Buddy's new personal assistant. And he quickly learns how abusive Buddy can be. Guy finally gets fed up with Buddy's torturous ways. Flips the script. And takes him for his own personal hostage. What follows is uh, some pretty good dark humor, heartbreak, and lots of paper cuts. Uh, To me, this is one of Spacey's defining roles and a role that he seems to tap into now and then for, you know, some of the roles that he plays, that he's played since then. So it also stars Frank Whaley. Uh, You might remember him from movies like Career Opportunities and Pulp Fiction. And also Benicio Del Toro has a small part. It's from about 1998, so all these guys look a little bit younger. So, <laughs> uh, you can find it on Netflix and probably in the the little cheap bin at the <laughs> at the, <laughs> at the Walmart. Walmart or uh, you know some if you've still got a movie store around somewhere. <laughs> all right, well, thanks, Brian. That was swimming with sharks. Now let's go to our stump the hoe answer, Justin. What was our question again, sir? Well, this week we wanted to go with uh, something a little Ted-centric, so I went to Seth MacFarlane. Uh, In 2009, Family Guy was nominated for a Best Comedy Series Emmy, making it only the second animated series ever to be nominated in that category. What was the first? Our options were A, Bugs Bunny, B, Popeye, C, The Flintstones, D, The Simpsons. Uh, Brian, I believe you said D, The Simpsons. Aaron and Scotty both went with C, the Flintstones. The correct answer would be Yabba Dabba Doo, the Flintstones. Yes, back in, I believe, 1961 was the first time that an animated TV show was ever nominated for Best Comedy Series. The Simpsons routinely wins Best Animated Series, but has never been nominated or won Best Comedy. Hmm. Excellent. Sorry, Brian, you are a loser. If anybody here wants to try to win a Stump the Ho or, or <laughs> I'm a Ho t-shirt, send us a Stump the Ho question. Anything you want, we'll randomly draw one of these questions just prior to showtime. The other hoes will not know anything about it. The random question has to stump at least two of our three remaining hoes. And uh, obviously I can't have the question or I can't participate because I'll be given the question. And you will win an I'm a Ho Hollywood Outsider t-shirt if your question is chosen. So sizes and quantities, again, are limited. Please send me your questions at feedback at thehollywoodoutsider.com. Hope we get some uh, some good responses from that. Okay, let's go to From the Outside In, where each week we talk about a topic that's on ours, our listeners' minds. This week uh, we're referring to a CNN article that questioned whether smoking on screen should trigger an R rating, which brings up an interesting topic. We all know the rating system is broken to a degree. There's been several t- several issues we've talked about in the last year. Uh, how would us hoes fix it? Who wants to go first? Justin. Fortunately, it's a bit too complicated i mean pg pg 13 r nc 17 i don't i i feel like they try and just narrow things down to too fine of a point and then you know you get into these this whole thing of you know a show is pg 13 but it's because it has you know you know adult violence or some nudity but then this other film has got um, it's rating because of some other type of violence. And w- if you can actually get a rating and then go and appeal that rating and then have that rating changed, then how really definitive is this rating anyway? That's an excellent I point. I don't know. It's just, I think if they were to just 
loosen things up a little bit. And instead of having, you know, six or seven different types of ratings, you know, just have your basic three. Just have, if your kid's under 13, here's a rating. If if you're under 21 or something, here's a rating. And then, I don't know, maybe that's even just it. I don't think we need this fine delineation of ratings anymore. It's kind of ridiculous. I think it could be. I a- would rather show, show me what, sh- show me what is, I guess, as far show me what the content is. Show me the, the, tell me what the themes are as far as excessive drug use, strong sexual content. I don't care that it's rated R, that it's rated PG 13, but if I've, if I've got an idea of what to expect, then I can kind of make my own assumptions from there. I think it really can be a lot more binary than, than the, than the different layers are doing now. Make a list of movies with a rating, like a G rated movie that is completely not going to be offensive to any children or parents for their children to see. And then if it's something that's not, that's not for kids, then like Brian said, list it out. Like they do on HBO and you watch a TV on HBO, you see right before the movie starts graphic nudity, you know, violence all this kind of stuff why and and part of the problem is is that different people have different varying degrees of what they have a problem with you go overseas and nudity is on regular tv or is that i don't know if that's actually true or not but i get like nudity is widely more much more accepted in europe than it is here over here violence is completely fine you but you show a booby on 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 screen and then there's a big (laughs) problem say booby yes (laughs) Booby. <laughs> He's like 12, man. Uh, that, that, I mean, that's a whole other discussion, but that's why I think having the individual listings of what the content is on there lets the parent decide, you know, if you're talking for the children, let the parent decide if it's something that they should be seeing. The parent should be, if they're that worried about it, should be watching the movie first before their kid does anyway. You know what? You no, know, one thing that really bothers me is NC 17. That, that's a big one. Okay. Nothing pornographic can really be in NC 17, but you can have extreme sexual encounters why wouldn't that just be r i mean basically r is restricted a parent has to be there supposedly to get you in to begin with what's the difference between an r rating and an nc-17 if you're a parent it seems like uh you can let your kids watch porn at home if you choose to what's the difference i don't understand it's really that the the parents and and that whole system is antiquated anyway Mm -hmm. i mean you know in this day and time where you can you know download free porn all this other stuff. I mean, really, I mean, how, how many parents are really getting their kids into a, an R rated movie or an NC 17 movie? I mean, it's so easy for these kids. Nobody's ch- not, Yeah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe the theaters in y'all's area are doing that, but I guess unless you look 12 walking in there saying, Hey, I want to see Caligula, <laughs> you know, I, they'll, they'll probably, you know, they'll probably turn you away. But if I, if you, if you're looking halfway 18, then, they're not. Go- they're going to take your money, in this day and time. They're going to take your money. They don't care, and there's nobody policing it anyway. So just forget this. You have to have a, an adult, your a parent or guardian to to get you in. Just get have maybe like say two or three, two or three ratings is a good idea. Just so you know, generally speaking, is it a kids movie, is it a an adult movie, or is this something that really needs to be. Uh, I guess stolen off the internet just filter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like 50 shades of gray or something. Well, <laughs> apparently that one's, <laughs> that's going to go all the way. Um, I, I just think the ratings board is, is very biased. It seems like, um, an act of sex will get you an R rating. Right. But apparently obscene language where you're just discussing sex, which honestly, I mean, who of us don't have friends that do this? You know what I mean? Um, that can get you an NC 17. That makes no sense to me showing a visual representation of sex seems to me like it would be a more extreme measure than talking about it. If I want to talk about, you know, <clears throat> horrible things being done sexually or violent or anything else, that shouldn't take precedence over actually seeing that. You know what I mean? Does that make Let's sense? Let's talk to you about sex, baby. You could take Let's the same you could you take the same token baby. with violence. You you talk about ripping somebody's head off or you actually visually see ripping somebody's head off, you know, is that is that as big a deal? Mhm. I mean, I, well, I think the, the fact that a certain number of f bombs will get you this rating, but you can get away with one or two. What the fuck is that about? What makes, that makes five no fucks worse than one fuck? 
No, and well, depends I would, on who's... Yeah, I'd agree with that. And then I, w- I will be honest with you. It seems to me that if PG-13 has just has just crossed the line, it's it's borderline R at this point for mm-hmm. what R used to be. Um, you know, the PG-13 rating was 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 created because of Gremlins and Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom because they had such extreme violence in those films. It was created for the violence, right? Mm-hmm. So that's been standing the test of time for quite some some time. But it seems like every year it's pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. And that seems to be that the ratings board, because these are mega blockbuster, these, a lot of these comic book action uh, films, and like Dark Knight is a, is a good example. That was a pretty dark, you know, I'm sorry to steal that, dark film and it got a pg-13 a lot of people at the time thought that should be rated r in england actually there was a huge controversy because of how that was rated you know okay for families when it should have been rated restricted um but it seems like violence is always okay sex always bad violence okay it's okay to have a natural and granted i'm not saying these relationships are all natural but having the act of procreation on screen but shooting someone in the face or, or blowing up Maggie Gyllenhaal, because that happens in The Dark Knight, Scott. Um, that's bad. I, I don't, or that's okay. I, I don't understand how they can take these two extremes and just basically flip a coin and decide which one is PG-13 and which ones are. Because there's really no language that says if this particular action happens, it's a PG-13. If well, this particular language happens, it's an it's an R. Well, part I've, of uh, yeah, part of that problem is you got the classification and rating administration that deals with this stuff. They're they're very similar to Congress. These fuckers don't go anywhere. You know, there's no turnover. The head's been a member. The head of it is has been a member for 24 years, and she's been leading it for the last 12. You know, get some turnover in there. More input from kind of a cross section of people. Every from actors, directors, writers, moms, dads, teenagers. I don't. You know, teachers. I don't. I don't care. Just get a some kind of a cross section. Maybe send out surveys. Find some. You know, find a whoever just to a whole cross section of people, and say and kind of find out what a general consensus is, and then kind of go from there. Revisit it every. I don't know five years or whatever. But I just think that there they there needs to be some kind of turnover in there because you've got these these older people up there that are really kind of out of touch with. What I guess you know the rest of the world is thinking. Yeah, I, I see action on television that warrants an R rating. I mean, if you watch Sons of Anarchy, uh, Justified, pretty much anything on FX, I think, um, or, or a lot of the other cable television shows, there are just as much dark violence on there as you'll find in a rated R film or a PG thirteen film. It really just depends. But there's a lot of violence that they would classify as an R rating. It doesn't deserve it. Yeah, I mean, remember when when Michael Schofield got killed? God <laughs> damn, that was awful. I think what's but more this... sad about the rating system is how that's become pivotal on on sales numbers. We we talked about this before, where a movie that's going to yeah, get an R rating true. is not going to sell as well as a PG thirteen movie, and, and I and I can't help but wonder how much of the politics of that are affecting these ratings. That's why I think doing a more simple rating system, like Brian was saying, either a two level or a three level, you know, I was saying that, but you know, whatever. Well, you know, you I just guys... made it sound better, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I and, that... and we can go, you know, but just we can, you know, we can discuss that further on the the Hollywood Outcast. That's right. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I don't know. I just personally, I get really uh, kind of twitchy when it comes to these sorts of things because it's all uh, a personal preference. I mean, you could label something excessively violent. But excessively violent in whose opinion? My opinion of excessive violence or excessive nudity or whatever is going to be much different than yours. So even just creating these labels and using them implies value that not everybody is going to share. And it's it's a difficult thing, I think, to try and say what's in a film that you should be maybe cautious about when not everybody is going to view those same things the same way. I mean, when I was a kid, my parents had no problem showing me Conan the Barbarian or letting me go see Porky's um, because they knew I was a fairly smart kid and I could handle it. Not every kid, unfortunately, is as smart as I am. (laughs) Wow. Wow. That was very Justin McCumber of you. See how I turned that into a compliment of myself? You know what? I am so proud of your modesty and how far it's come (laughs) since we (laughs) started a year ago. Thank you. I hope you properly stretched that arm out from you know, before you patted yourself on the back. I, I do. I stretch. Yeah. Beyonce <laughs> called. Yoke, she wants her attitude good. back. Mm-hmm. 
Um, it's it's obviously it's something that we all talk about. We all discuss it week in week out. You know, there's always something where it seems to come up. At what point do you think people are going to say this antiquated system that is not really working unless you happen to be a a large proponent of the system itself? You know, like a Universal or a Paramount or or um, um, Warner Brothers or something like that. At what point do you think they're going to address the system and say, you know what, it needs to be overhauled. We aren't in touch with what's going on currently. Right. Television is kicking our ass with with restrictions and stuff like that, and what should be what how things should be rated properly and whatnot. At what point do you think they're going to address that? I don't think they're going to, and I think that if they ever actually did, it would be to make it even more definitive, more restrictive. I think liberal types aren't prone to bitching about the ratings board, whereas those who are much more conservatively minded and hate, you know, if a movie's got a little bit of skin or some violence or some uh, foul language that are, you know, slipping into the movies that they think should have been rated, you know, worse. I think that's the segment of our populace that's going to be more vocal and calling for action. So I don't ever see it changing, and if it does, I don't see it for the better. I think the bigger question is when are the parents going to start taking responsibility instead of leaving it on the shoulders of some other entity that's going to be putting a rating on it that may or may yeah, not. Parents don't raise their, yeah, they don't raise their kids anymore. It's you know They let the schools raise them. They let everybody else be responsible for them except their own selves. Are we all looking at Aaron right now? Yep. <laughs> Fuck you, reader. <laughs> well, you know, he's betting 500. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. I got nothing more to add. Okay, me not, either. No. I'm not allowed to talk about children for at least... <laughs> no, at, you're not. <laughs> at least 20 to 24 episodes, I think. And Is that what the court said? Yeah, that's what, that's what the restriction was. And within 50 right. feet of a school. Yeah, can be within 50 yeah feet that of added school. about 15, 20 minutes to his commute in the mornings. <laughs> <laughs> He's got to get a whole new van. Oh, shit. Let's <laughs> so get windows in this one. Lot, lots of windows. <laughs> okay. Anything more before we wrap up? No, I think we're good. Uh, okay. All right, well, if you guys have any more for uh, any tidbits you want to throw at us for how you think the ratings board could change things, send us a... Uh, Send us an email, feedback at com. Let's go to closing. we got a couple of emails and whatnot. Uh, the first one is from Ashley. Ashley says, Scott didn't rate Magic Mike. Inquiry Minds need to know how much money he would dish out to see that. He actually did. Uh, we listened to it. He actually does rate it 7 out of 10 because he likes that jiggling. <laughs> she goes on to say, My friends and I wanted to kill ourselves watching the horrific acting skills or lack thereof of Cody Horn. Her, you, I smell something rancid at all times face was infuriating, and she is very accurate on that. We actually enjoyed ourselves about one-third of this movie because it was genuinely funny at points, but when Matthew McConaughey stopped being funny and the movie stopped being lighthearted, it needed to be over. It was about an hour too long. And what was up with that damn micro pig? Three out of ten from her. Now on to her favorite movie cliche. Three out of ten, wow. Apparently she didn't see enough Tatum. Just, just to clarify, mm-hmm. I gave it a seven cute girl that listens to our show give it a three yeah what's it say about you scott (laughs) (laughs) okay (laughs) you liked tatum's ass more than she did a lot more almost more than twice more actually okay Uh, let's go to her favorite uh movie cliches horror the one (laughs) the one white broad that hears something strange and goes to i did not say broad by the way the one white broad that hears something strange and goes to investigate. Come on, girl. You know damn well you aren't surviving shit. The one the one friend that goes back to save the other friend from the serial killer after breaking free from their bondages. Look, if I break free, you're on your own. I'll come back with help. Uh, romantic comedies, those two people that loathe one another, but damn it, if placed in a room for long enough, they're going to fall in love and get to know each other biblically. <laughs> Thanks for taking the email, and as always, awesome show, Ashley. <laughs> That's actually pretty funny. <laughs> Uh, next one, this one, this one helps me out because I honestly don't know anything about this series. Brian pretended like he did, <laughs> but <laughs> look, if I would have went into this much depth, you would have, you would have stopped the podcast and said, shut the fuck up. Okay. Well, I'm going to read it because people want to know, uh, that's from Micah H. It says, I heard the discussion this week involving guardians of the galaxy and the tie-in with the Marvel Universe. Being a comic book geek, I'd like to clear up a bit on Thanos. He's an extremely powerful titan in the Marvel Universe, 
During the Infinity Gauntlet storyline in the early 90s, Thanos used the Infinity Gauntlet to wipe out half of the life in the universe. It took all of the Marvel heroes on Earth, half the others from the Marvel Galaxy, and finally Adam Warlock to best him. I have no idea who any of those people are. In a nutshell, no I guess not. In a nutshell, what this means is that even the Phoenix, I know who that is, Jean's, uh, Jean Grey's character from X-Men Last Stand, with all the world, otherworldly power that the Phoenix possesses, pales in comparison to Thanos' power, especially if he collects the Infinity Gems, which exponentially increases power. There's way too many big words. The name redacted could never beat him. Sorry, Hulk, Thanos is no puny god. Or even have a chance of beating him without the aid of some extremely powerful mutants slash gods. And I think this is the tie-in that Marvel is trying for. If this is the case, I expect Name Redacted Part 2 to <laughs> be even more amazing than the... In case you haven't caught on, Name Redacted means the Avengers. So uh, More amazing than the first one. Sorry, Ashley, going there again. That's funny. You actually mentioned Ashley. I am excited to see what they do with the Guardians. I haven't read comics in about 15 years, so I don't even know who the new Guardians are, but I would imagine this is the way they are going. Adam Warlock will be with them yet again. He's the only cosmic entity that has bested Thanos on multiple occasions. <gasps> Done. <laughs> do you guys know anything about this shit? Uh, I, I read the Infinity Gauntlet and the Infinity War way back in the day, but it has been quite some time. But I'm familiar with those, yes. So that all makes sense to you? Yes. Okay. I love that our listeners are referencing each other in emails. Yeah, that's pretty funny. That's awesome. <laughs> that's pretty funny. Maybe they should do the, outs the Hollywood Outcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, next week we're going to look at the upcoming films The Watch and Step Up Revolution. Oh, I can't wait. And coming soon we're going to have our, arc our Dark Knight spoiler cast where we are looking at the full Dark Knight saga and how we feel the story ends. And we'll probably be discussing a certain female character's death. I hope Scott's prepared for that. I'm never going to live it down. <laughs> you can always find us at thehollywoodoutsider.com. Be sure to stay through the credits for outtakes. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash thehollywoodoutsider. Email us at feedback at thehollywoodoutsider.com with any topics. Stump the whole questions, especially if you want to be in our contest. Or uh, what's this movie clips? Tell your friends, subscribe on iTunes, Zoom, Google Reader, listen on your Stitcher radio app. Give us a thumbs up if you do or any plain old RSS feed. Thanks to each of the podcasters. Brian Williams is available on Twitter at Brian WMS. Thanks, B. Hey, yeah, can um, can I breathe? Can we can we order t-shirts yet? You know what? Speaking of t-shirts, Brian, here's what you can do. If if you like, if you don't want to take a chance with that contest because uh, you want a better than one in whatever chance of winning, um, you can if you donate twenty dollars to the site because we're obviously we're not trying to make money, but we're trying to pay for what we do. Uh, if you donate $20 or more, we will send you a Hollywood Outsider Amaho t-shirt. That said, if you don't, if you donate $50 or more, we will send you three t-shirts. Now, the sizes and quantities are limited, so keep in mind that we will get in touch with you as soon as we receive a donation. You can go to thehollywoodoutsider.com and do your donation there. How's that, Brian? Is that good? Thank you. Okay. I've been worried. I've been wondering about that for the last hour and a half. Okay. <laughs> Justin McCumber, he's the host of the Dead Robot Society, weekly podcast for aspiring writers, available at deadrobotsociety.com. Thanks, Justin. Hey, thanks, man. While you guys were reviewing those other movies, I ordered my IMAX Batman trilogy tickets. Boom. Thursday night, I'm in the theater. <laughs> I'm going to be in the theater, too, but I don't have to get there until midnight or 11.15. I can't wait to see all three of them in IMAX. Actually, I'm kind of jealous of Justin. Yeah, that would be really cool to see on IMAX. And Scott Clark, he's available on Twitter at Scotty Lindsay. Thanks, Scott. Hey, thanks, man. Thanks for talking about video games this week. Oh, my God. I thought the whole well, freaking news section was for you. Somebody <laughs> has to because somebody else isn't doing it anymore. Oh, salt Aww. in the wound. Do you, do you want to tell people that in case people have, are looking for it? Because it is like the first of the month. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, people the, are uh, looking for it? <laughs> God damn. <laughs> yeah, the uh, official thread podcast is on a, on a hiatus <laughs> at this point. Uh uh, at least temporarily that might, might pick it up again later on. But in uh, other words, it puts the dead in dead robot society. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Hey, my show is going strong, bitch. Your, yeah. yeah. The dead robot society is good, but you know, the okay. other one, not so much. And, and uh, Justin's book, Haywire is available now on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, iBooks, and for your Kindle or Nook, as well as his new DRS collection, which is called Explorers. Beyond the Horizon. Beyond the Horizon. So as always, kids, the next time you go to a theater, make sure Bye, Pop. Understand that I'm doing the best I can
Now let's go to From the Outside In, where each week we talk about a topic that's on ours or our listeners' minds. This week, we're going to refer to, there's a CNN article that questioned whether smoking on screen should tigger, uh, <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> tigger. Was that the sneezy cat? Yeah, cat bit me. I wasn't scratching her ears right. <laughs> Kitty, like, Kitty likes to scratch. Mm-hmm. Meow. I got an email from Sean. He said that he laughed out loud at the pedophile drift <laughs> part. That, that seems to be a big hit. It, it seems to be real. It was funnier now. It's catching on. Because it, like, it took like a good four or five seconds for us to go, what the fuck are you talking about, Aaron? <laughs> yeah. I listened to it again, and I didn't feel any safer about myself. <laughs> So you ready to get that uh, Hollywood Outcast podcast going? <laughs> Ditch these two fucking losers. <laughs> it's been <laughs> tell you, man, it's been a running joke, but after last week, it's sounding a lot better. <laughs> well, and one of the fucking outtakes he used has made me sound like the perv, and it was really me trying to make you sound like the perv, <laughs> but he didn't let it finish. Right. <laughs> so I come off looking like the fucking pedophile. <laughs> I caught that too. I'm like. Nice. <laughs> All right, ladies. Got a bunch of lawbreakers up in here. <laughs> you do it so much better. <laughs> it's like when Aaron does it, I just I, I picture this little thin mustache. <laughs> I haven't drank in two weeks, thank you very much. Yay! Congratulations. Yay. I hope we had a little something to do with that. Another couple of weeks, you'll get your first coin, right? 30 days. <laughs> he hates everybody. I do not. That's that's my, my persona. That's not who I am. I'm actually a very caring person. Scott knows. Please defend me. Yeah. 